it's Marlo from Wild Food UK. It's the 5th of October today and I'm at my um, friend Pete's uh, small holding where he's invited us to come and do a little bit of a mushroom survey and uh, we have found loads of really really cool stuff so we're going to do a little video of the best things that I think you guys should know about and uh, we'll leave out all the little brown mushrooms that we uh, find along the way um, but yeah Pete thanks for having us how much, how much land have you got here? Uh, so our plot is about two and a quarter acres roughly split into three so we've got the, uh, the garden area and the house over there we've got an orchard just behind us and then you've got the field here where we have occasionally a horse and some chickens and some pigs and those sorts of things. Yeah, they're probably going to make an appearance on the video. They it's quite are. a biodiverse little two and a half <coughs> acres though, or two and a quarter did you say? Two, two and a quarter, yeah, and it's one of the things that we're trying to do here is, you know, we bought this plot of land to, to try and sort of coexist a little bit with nature and to maybe try and be a little bit more self-sustained and, and, you know, self Live the good things. life. Live the good life. My yeah. wife's favourite TV programme is the good life. fan of Felicity life. Kendall. That's the one, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> right, well, we're starting our little walk around at Pete's uh, little um, orchard pub, I suppose, the Stag's Head. And we're going to end up back here at the end for a little chat as well. But before we get started talking about the mushrooms, um, could you tell us a little bit about what you do? What does RSK stand for? What's, what's Biosensus? So RSK Biosensus, that's the company that I work for. They're a, a mixed ecological consultancy. So um, the sort of work we do is to, to inform planning developments and things like that. Basically, if somebody's going to go out there and start knocking down a building, chopping down trees or digging up fields. We don't like them doing it, but these things happen. It's the world that we live in. What we do first and foremost is make sure that when they do that, they're not going to break the law. So they're not going to do something that might damage a protected species or a great crested newt or a bat or, or that sort of thing. And my role within the company specifically is I head up the aquatic ecology team there. So my specialist interest is fish. Um, I also have a bit of an interest in crayfish as well and, and invasive species. So. I suppose doing do. what you do, you get a kind of overview of uh, lots of different ecological um, sides of the, of the sciences and uh, mushrooms is something I know you know a little bit about but I also know that there's some mushrooms on your land that you're not too sure of at the moment, is that yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean I think most ecologists are interested in the natural world as a whole and certainly that's the case for me, so although aquatic ecology has always been my specialism um, I've been out surveying dormice recently, I've got a barn owl license and in fact so we might see later as we're walking back we've got a barn owl box where we had some barn owls fledged earlier this year and, and mushrooms is one of those things, it, mushrooms and plants when we moved into this property I knew very little about botany or mushrooms and suddenly I had all of this land with all of these things growing and I'd kind of like to know what they are, hence me inviting you in. Barlow so that you can tell me a little bit more about some of the things on my land that I didn't know anything about. Superb. So just lastly, if someone does need a biosensus of some sort, how do they get in touch with RSK? Uh, so they can, if you just Google RSK biosensus, you'll be able to find our website there. There are contact details on there. So ecologybidding at rskbiosensus.com or you can email me directly, peter.walker at rskbiosensus.com and I'll be able to put you in touch with Person, whether it's a bat survey that you need or a fish survey it would be me and um, just drop us a line and we'll put you in touch with the right person obviously if it's mushrooms you have someone else you can go to absolutely you invite the uh, hairy oddballs me and Attila around we're much better on mushrooms anyway should we go and see what you've got let's do it yes this way first I think. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not actually foraging in a graveyard this time, but right beside this gravestone, we've got our first lovely, interesting mushrooms. Down here, we've got one of the coral fungus. Now, Pete, this isn't one that I'm gonna be able to tell you the actual species of right now. In fact, I can't even for sure tell you the, the genus. This is a fantastic looking coral fungus in uh, uh, the, probably the Romaria genus. I'm, I can't be totally sure. Attila, what do you think? Well, I would put them somewhere around Romarias for sure. 
So this is one that we're going to have to actually go away and do some microscopy on or some further tests to be able to tell you exactly what these are. It must be quite nice for you guys to come across something where you, you don't know exactly what it is. In the mushroom and... world, Pete, that happens all the time, <laughs> believe me. Um, but over here was the more interesting of the mushrooms. Now, uh, obviously you're interested in uh, the mushrooms from uh, a number of levels. You're interested in them because you're interested in nature, but you're also interested in them because you love the taste of absolutely, mushrooms. Now, absolutely. these are a mushroom that I'm going to show you in uh, the uh, Clytocybe or the funnel cap family. And uh, this is a reasonably complex family. Um, so again, to be totally sure I'm going to have to do some further investigation with my books, I think, with Attila's help to be able to ID this to species. But the funnel cap family have uh, what we call decurrent gills. You can see the gills there run down the stem, meaning that they're attached to the stem and they, they run down a bit like you see on a chanterelle, I suppose. Um, they don't stop at the stem or disappear off up into the cap of the mushroom. And uh, in, in the Clytocybe family, uh, there are some truly deadly mushrooms. Right. Um, there's uh, the Fool's Funnel, which, uh, the, uh, well, Clytocybe rivulosa or deal batter. There's a bit of debate about uh, which of the scientific names you should use for it, as far as I know. And uh, this is very similar to, to those mushrooms. I don't think it's uh, the Clytus. I don't think it's the Fool's Funnel itself. I think from looking at it with this uh, shiny, slightly pinking cap, and the fact that the gills aren't extremely decurrent, uh, that this is uh, a different type of Clytus ivy, possibly the, the Frosty Funnel. Do we know the um, scientific name for the Frosty Funnel, Attila? Uh, I know, probably I will pronounce it wrongly. It is Clytus ivy philophila or philophila. Uh, I don't know which one is uh, the English kind of Latin pronunciation. Okay, right. Well, um, I want you to remember this mushroom because I'm going to show you. We've obviously already had a little walk around to see what's around. But I want you to remember this mushroom because there's another mushroom that I'm going to show you later on in your garden, which is very similar to this, right. which is an edible mushroom. But this one here is uh, potentially deadly. Let's just uh, put it that way. And when you've got... Uh, a mushroom that looks a bit like this. The first thing I'd recommend is to uh, have a bit of a smell of the mushroom. So let's both do that and see what we think we get. And if you break a mushroom, then you're gonna get more of the smell. Um, so I'm getting a nice mushroomy smell, Pete. I don't know about I you. I am, it smells, smells delicious. It smell, <laughs> smells quite sweet, doesn't it? Yeah, maybe almost a hint of citrus to it somewhere. But... Uh, hmm. Am I imagining that? No, possibly, possibly. Um, but what we've got to take note of um, is the environment, because we've, we're not totally <coughs> sure of either of these two mushrooms that I've shown you first up, uh, we've got to take note of the environment and the trees that are around. So obviously these are growing out of wood chip. Um, the two trees that I can see, we've got some fir trees and um, a, uh, a sycamore, it looks like above us. Yeah. Now the sycamore doesn't have any ectomycorrhizal fungus. So this mushroom is certainly not associated with the, the sycamore, but it could be associated with the fir trees, as could the uh, coral fungus that we saw over there. Um, but there's a very good chance, particularly with the coral fungus, that it's a, a saprotrophic mushroom, a, okay. a rotter. So it's not necessarily associated with the trees, it's just growing out of the wood chip here, rotting the wood. Yeah. And that could also be the case with this. So those are two things that we have to take note of uh, if we're going to go and try and ID the mushrooms later on. Um, sometimes even that's not enough though. Sometimes you still need microscopy. Um, but remember that smell. It's a, a sweet mushroomy swell, smell. Can we is, can we agree on I, that? Definitely, yeah. And, but, and smells like something I would definitely want to put in my risotto. Okay. But definitely not. <laughs> uh, well, definitely not from uh, my initial look at it. Um, certainly, if you've got 
decurrent gills <coughs> on a white all over mushroom, then that is a warning sign. In fact, if there is a warning color in the mushroom world, it is white. If a mushroom is white all over in the UK, then it could potentially be one of our deadly poisonous mushrooms. I think there's probably about 25 or so, maybe 30 truly deadly poisonous mushrooms and a large percentage, probably a third, maybe more of those truly deadly poisonous mushrooms are white all over. So just remember that and we'll take one of these uh, with us so that I can compare it to another white all over mushroom that we're going to find later on. Anyway, a nice little start. We haven't even got into your actual wild <laughs> part, but we've already found two lovely species of mushrooms, plus uh, at least four or five other little brown mushrooms that I'm not going to uh, talk about on the video, not waste your time with today. Um, so yeah, let's move on. Good start. Great. We've not come far and we've st we're still not into his paddocks or his nice wild bits. We're still in his actual garden. And right here by his trampoline, we've found another mushroom here. Here's a, a mature one and there's a, a young one still in the ground there. I'm gonna leave that one there. In fact, I just lift that up. There's an even younger one there. Now, if you can see those concentric circles on the cap there, that to me immediately indicates that it's in the, the milk cap group of mushrooms, the Lactarius and the Lactiflus. And as soon as you've uh, got a milk cap, what you need to do is start looking at the environment around. There's only a few that are very easy to tell just by uh, their morphological features, by what they look like. Um, so what we look around for is what trees are around right behind us. We have a lovely, big, mature beech tree. Beech trees are my favorite trees because beech trees have the widest variety of edible mycorrhizal fungus growing with them in the UK. And that gives me a clue that this is probably the beech milk cap, Lactarius blennius. So if it is, we're gonna see some white milk coming out where damaged and you can damage the gills on the milk caps to get those drops coming out. There they are. And uh, sometimes when they're dry, you don't really get the drops from the uh, gills. And what you can do then is break off the stem and around the top of the stem, where it meets the gills, where you break it, you quite often still, even on a dry specimen, get an example of the milk there. So yeah, Lactarius blennius. Um, Pete, from an edibility point of view, I, uh, I would stay away from uh, any milk caps you find in your garden, unless they lactate bright orange milk. Um, as you guys probably know, if you've been watching the channel, that means that you've got possibly the saffron milk cap, which is uh, obviously not going to grow with beech trees, but its scientific name is Lactarius deliciosus, gives you a hint at how tasty it is, or one of the other orange, orange milked milk caps, which in the UK are all edible. There are some mildly toxic ones with white milk, uh, there's no deadly poisonous milk caps in the UK, but there's some that can certainly give you a dicky tummy and some of them uh, can have extremely spicy milk to the point where I've heard uh, that they can even, if you were to put the milk on your tongue, potentially blister your tongue. That's just hearsay. I've never seen any evidence of that, but I've heard it uh, maybe as a forager's tale quite a few times. Anyway our beech milk cap, Lactarius blennius. This week anyway, until the mycologists decide to change the scientific name. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm 
Matula from Wifood UK. It's one of the rare occasions when I give my face to the uh, camera. I'm not really like to be filmed, but this is a polypore and who could say no to a beautiful polypore? Uh, as you can see the tree, you know, this log is coming from a family of plants called prunus. It's one of the cherry uh, family. It might be either a cherry tree or a plum tree, somewhere around, definitely part of the rosaceae family of uh, plants. Because this mushroom, this particular mushroom here, the cushion bracket or Phalaenus tuberculosus, is growing on them. It's a parasitic mushroom, a necrotrophic parasite. During the years, uh, it slowly kills its host. It's a beautiful mushroom for me because I don't own any or owe any uh, orchard, so it's not making or causing me any damage, especially financial damage. But this mushroom is really often can be found uh, in uh, towns, cities, when uh, the roadside uh, trees were badly pruned and the wounds left uh, uncovered, untreated, and the spores of this mushroom easily can go in. What we should know about them, uh, as I said, it's a necrotrophic parasite and it's growing uh, year after year, so it's a perennial polypore and it causes uh, so-called white rot to the central uh, part of the wood of the tree. So it's technically killing it from inside, which is definitely not a good sign. And when you see you know, uh, individual fruiting bodies can uh, merge together and create a whole layer of, of uh, a fungal infection, which just, you know, increase the damage on the tree structure. So whenever you see this one, just try to find out who is the tree surgeon nearby or who is responsible for that particular tree, because in heavy wind, it might cause uh, the tree fall into pieces and uh, make some uh, damage, make some accidents. It needs a wound in the tree for the spores to be able to get into and infect the tree though, doesn't it? Yes, uh, it needs an opportunity uh, to enter. So it's not that kind of strong parasite going through a healthy, uh, fully covered, fully barked tree. So it needs an open wound. It might be a, a buck hole or, or, you know, as I mentioned, uh, a wrong pruning method wrong pr not really good pruning practice which leaves an open wound and this is when the or enter. one of those silly people who likes to carve their names into the sides of trees that creates a wound that these spores could get into yes also uh, there are some people who like to pick cherries with the cherry branches which definitely make a huge damage on the tree well pulling the branch off instead of just the cherry yes indeed there you go so pick your cherries carefully and don't tag trees please people thank you very much attila you're very welcome pete come on down and uh, pick one of these Let's take the small one it's a yeah. cuter and uh, you know a bit about mushrooms? Tell me what you see and what you think. A little bit. So no gills on the bottom. It's got these spongy pores instead. So that tells me that it's a belete mushroom of some sort. Okay, yeah, that's a, a very good start, sir. And what do you know about beletes from an edibility point of from view? From an edibility. Um, you're testing me now and past knowledge, but I think if they stay in red, or blue, you to approach them with caution. Very close, sir, very close, right. The actual rule that I teach beginners, and right. I think you're a little bit past beginner stage. That's is very nice uh, of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, you did promise me a drink later, so. <laughs> um, all right, the, uh, the rules uh, that I teach to beginners is no red on the outside and okay. no staining blue when they cut in half. But there are plenty of edible members of the wider Belitali group. You know, it's actually, now that the DNA of mushrooms has been unraveled, it's been split up into something like 27 different genres. So just to say Belitus might enrage any mycologists that are standing near us. <laughs> um, but uh, what we've got here is one of the Xericomeloid Belites or the cracking Belites, if you like. And they always, or almost always, have a bit of red on the stem, which you can see there. Now, with the uh, dangerous members of uh, the spongy bottom mushrooms, the wider belitali, it's really red on the pores that you need to worry about, more than red on the stem, orangey red, and they fade from red to orange. Uh, so this is not 
one of the dangerous ones. Um, it is in quite a complex little group though, the, uh, the cracking beliefs, the Zerica Meloids. I think we've got uh, seven, might be five or seven in the UK, and it's quite difficult to uh, ID them to species. Um, but what I can say is every single one of the cracking beliefs in the UK is edible. Um, other beliefs will crack on the cap, but there is a very good example of what we mean when we say a red cracking belete. The Xericomelus chrysenteron, the actual red cracking belete, um, normally shows red where it's cracked. And there is a bit of red there uh, where you can see that damage there. Now, all of these are edible. Um, they're not considered uh, choice edibles, but um, I think they're actually quite good. Yeah. Um, when you remove the pores, so what you do is you take off that spongy underside of the mushroom, it removes quite easily. And Pete, what you do is you throw that around your garden, <laughs> uh, which means that you're distributing any spores that are viable at the time of you yep. picking it. So you're giving a little bit back and you're removing the bits of the mushroom that to me aren't particularly good culinarily. Now you don't end up with very much of a mushroom then. We can see a bit of staining, a little bit of bluing there. Um, you don't end up with very much of a mushroom. It's not gonna win any Michelin stars for, for presentation um, and it's quite small. But these are, um, for me anyway, the most common section of the, the spongy bottom mushrooms, the wider Belitali, and look at that bluing there coming on a little bit stronger now. So they are a good one to get confident with because they grow in all types of environments. I find them in woodland, around field edges, and uh, prolifically, quite often by the hundred. So they're a good one to know. And uh, for me, once you've removed those pores, get rid of that bottom of the stem. What you've got there is a tasty bit of mushroom left. Right. I've removed one of the features. If I wanted to try and identify this to species, I would want to know how it stains at the base of the mushroom after cutting it in half. And when we um, report back to you on the survey, we'll um, tell you which of the Xericomeloids this actually is. But from a beginner forager's point of view, um, it does break my no red, no blue rule, but it doesn't really morphologically resemble the Satan's Belit at all, uh, or the Rubro Belitus Legalii. Those are the two that are particularly dangerous. They're not deadly, but they will make you very, very sick. I'll drop in a little photo of uh, the Satan's Belit now so you can see the difference. Look at the thin stem on our Xericomeloids and look at the fat stem on the picture of the Satan's Belit that should be coming up right now. Anyway, this is uh, the first uh, reasonably good edible that we found in your garden and we still haven't even got to the good stuff. <laughs> so let's move on and see what else we can find. Anyway, do you think you'd be confident with these? I think I'd be confident with those going forward. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. A nice start to our edible. We, we haven't even got a basket. Where's the basket? We haven't. Do you know what? Well, we move to the next place, I'll nip in and get a basket. Good man, good man, let's move on. <laughs> It's uh, about to start filling up. It's a bit embarrassingly empty at the moment, but we've got uh, uh, Pete's little birch cops now. And um, along with beech, birch are a fantastic uh, species of tree for edible mycorrhizal fungus. And we've got one of those down here. So do you know this one, Pete? Let's have a look. Yeah, I think I've seen this one before. I, usually a lot bigger than this when I, when I find it. This looks like quite a small one. Mm -hmm. So looking at the colour and the, the colour on the, the stalk here, I'm going 
guess that this is a brown birch belete. I think you're absolutely spot on, sir. So what do you know about the, the birch belete? Or, or rather the lexinums, we should call them, because they don't all grow with birch. Uh, not an awful lot. I know we can, certainly this one, we can eat. Certainly, absolutely. Yeah. This is one of the lexinums, and we can tell it's a lexinum because of uh, the flocculose nature of the stem. I always like to describe it as like a dirty lint tea towel, if you like. Now, this one is the brown birch belete. We also get the orange birch belete, and we get a number of others in the UK. But what to know as a forager is that any of the beletes or the lexinums uh, that have this, well, all the lexinums have this flocculose nature on the stem, every single one in the whole world is edible. So Good whenever news. you're out and you see this flocculose stem on a spongy bottom mushroom, then you have an edible mushroom. Now, this isn't one of the best ones for just frying up and using like a normal mushroom. This is one to go in your dehydrator. So we'll put it in the basket and later on, put it in your dehydrator, dry it out and use it as a flavoring. Attila likes to powder them after they've been dehydrated. I like to just use them a bit like a bouquet garni, you know, so if you're putting them in a stew, put them in and then fish them out at the end because they remain quite leathery if you're just using chunks of the stem. Yeah. And again, I would remove the sponge before we, uh, before we take it. So again, the sponge removes very easily. And because we know the habitat of this mushroom, it's in the name, the brown birch belete, Lexinum scabrum. What we do with the sponge of this one is we throw it at the nearest birch trees and we hope that one of those spores takes and you get even more Lexinum scabrums, even more brown birch beletes growing in the future. So yeah. Happy days. Any Lexinum's an edible mushroom. In the basket then. There we go. Let's move on. Whoa, okay, that's an interesting one, at least for me. Uh, this leathery structure here, you probably uh, notice some purplish tinge uh, on the underneath. And the reason is because it's called Chondrostereum purpureum, which is known as silver leaf fungus in English. And if I mention silver leaf, you might think of, oh, that's a nasty mushroom because it causes the silver leaf uh, disease on your cherry and all the other fruit trees. But for all the others, like this one, uh, is not a fruit tree. It is just a saprotrophic mushroom. So technically breaking down the already dead uh, tree but material. Uh, if I made any mistake and it is somehow, a, you know, still a fruit tree. I'm not a tree surgeon, so sorry if I, I was wrong. It might be the cause of death because they can... Uh, that's a poplar. Perfectly fine. So it is just a saprotrophic mushroom here. Uh, so follow the purple tinge at the underneath and you can't see any pores or gills or sponge or anything. It's like a purplish painted layer. It is a really common feature with all the crusts and particularly this one. Silver leaf fungus, be aware. Interesting to you, Attila. I Not think you interesting to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't eat this one. Yes, indeed. We'll go and find the edibles now, Pete. Sounds good. Right now, Pete, now we're getting into the real good stuff. I think uh, I can't be totally sure uh, at the moment, but this to me looks like one of my favorite mushrooms that we get growing around the UK. Uh, in fact, there's a few in this genus. This is an agaricus mushroom. You can tell that it looks a lot like the mushrooms that you buy in the shops. And uh, uh, in the UK, there's probably at least 37 different members of the agaricus genus. Wow. And uh, most of them are edible. There's only two, uh, possibly one or two more that are toxic. And those toxic ones, they have some really easy key defining features. So first of all, if I run my nail over the cap of this mushroom, if it was the toxic yellow stainer, or the Xanthodermus group of mushrooms, 
we'd see some yellow staining, some bright, vibrant yellow staining where I damaged the cap. Now there is actually a little bit of yellowing there. So because of that, we have to uh, do our second test with the agaricus, and that's just employ your nose. Now, you've got two or three more of these growing around the field. I would recommend putting something to protect them from your chickens um, so that they don't <laughs> get pecked or knocked over because they'll grow into a huge mushroom. Now, let's cut this one. I'll show you what I mean. Look at the size of that stem. Wow, that's a that is stem. going to be a chunky mushroom which means that it is um, probably either the the horse mushroom agaricus arvensis um, or it's the agaricus crocodilinus um, so let's have a little and horse smell. mushrooms of course one of the most prized edible mushrooms that, that you can find in the UK, aren't they? Yeah, I, I rate them along with the porcini, flavour-wise. Now, we have a little smell. Hello, puppy dog. Have a smell of that. Tell me what you get. Unmistakable, that's aniseed. Yes, Yeah, absolutely. unmistakable aniseed smell. So what we've got there is uh, a 100% definitely edible agaric um, I, I'm not totally convinced that it's not the crocodilinus actually, but you certainly have a lovely edible find there. And before your doggy knocks a tiller over, I think we should move on. Everyone uh, know, that watches the channel, I hope um, you've watched our the complexities of the agaricus group mushroom uh, video that we did uh, not too long ago, um, which is why or, or which explains why it's very hard to ID uh, any mushrooms from this genus to species level, or quite a lot of them uh, anyway, to, to species level. Um, but to, uh, to, to figure out whether it's edible or not, those are the two tests you have to do. Just does it stain yellow and what does it smell like? The, um, uh, the, the Xanthodermis group, the poisonous side, of the uh, agaricus <laughs> mushrooms, they um, they have an awful smell. Pete. They smell right. uh, like Indian ink. People describe it, but it's just not a pleasant smell. And if you were to put one of them in your uh, frying pan, that smell would get a hell of a lot worse and put you off. But the edible ones, they either smell of aniseed or they smell of almond, or uh, they'll smell just like the mushrooms that you buy in the shops. Which um, is because the mushrooms that you buy in the shops are one of this genus of mushroom right. just cultivated in different ways so yeah there go. this is the best edible find so far but i think, definitely going in the basket yes i think there's some even better stuff to come though let's move on Well, we've left out most of the little brown mushrooms that we've uh, found today, but this one is one that I want you guys to see because this is in the Entoloma genus of mushrooms, the pink gills. Now, the pink gills are not edible mushrooms. See the cap there with the little nipple, umbo on the uh, top. They are not edible mushrooms, but um, I'm pleased to tell Pete that they are an indicator of good untouched natural pasture land. So this shows that the area around here hasn't been polluted with chemicals and things like that, which is something I think Pete will be quite pleased to hear. All right, so I've seen loads of these lying around your garden, Pete. These don't look particularly natural. Can you tell me what this is? They're not natural at all. So this is a, a, a artificial refugia for reptile surveys or reptiles and sometimes amphibians as well. And I put a few of these out around my land just to see if we're lucky enough to have some reptiles living here. And so far we have been, we've had lots of grass snakes and just this year, um, just in the last couple of weeks, we found our first slow worms, including some tiny, tiny juvenile ones, which means we have a breeding population of slow worms here, which I'm absolutely delighted about. Okay, I love slow worms. In fact, my Facebook avatar is me holding a slow worm. So please, let's see if we can see one. Okay, fingers crossed.
Nope. <laughs> you got a few more though. Let's try another one. We'll try to go. Just here, guys. Hey! This is one of our babies. Oh, what a little cutie! The reptile world, they don't get much cuter than that. Absolutely. So this is not a snake, this is a legless lizard. Do you know its scientific name, Pete? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I really oh, should be able to. I'll put you, you on, the spot, on the spot there. Either way. It's uh, clearly not a grass snake or an adder because of the single line that goes down the back of this, which is a legless lizard. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Pete. This is, this is almost my favourite find of the day. You're kidding me, Attila. My hair does not look okay, but we'll get on anyway, <laughs> shall we? Right, there's another species down here. We're going to do this pretty quickly because light is a fading. And this is probably the most typical of the ones that we've got here. And so what you've got here is one of the bluet family or genus. And they all have this lovely lilac colouring to the gills there. Now, this one is the Lepista sordida or the sordid bluet. And um, I wouldn't say this was an absolutely typical one because quite often the edge of the cap is uh, almost translucent. It becomes okay. very, very thin. And uh, the bluets, although they are edible and they're considered a gourmet mushroom in the shops and uh, by restaurateurs, I don't think, um, you know, we've all got different taste buds. So course, yeah. try them for yourself but they're not my favorite mushroom. They've got a bit of a perfumey smell, so okay. have a nice smell there. And you'll see what I mean. Oh, yeah, it's a, really a, quite perfumey. Yeah, it's an unusual smell. And I, I find that they have a kind of almost perfumey flavor as well. So if uh, you gave me the choice between a kilo of these uh, Lepista sordidas or this one lovely tasty agaric here, I'm taking this one lovely tasty agaric every time but you've got Sounds quite good. a few growing your grassland so it'll try... be worth giving them a try then yeah exactly try them for yourself everyone's different we've all got our own taste buds we are all unique human beings so you might like them even though i don't what's your thoughts on the lapistas attila well i would definitely take the agaricus in this case yeah you're with me then yes good stuff Right, let's move on to the real highlight, just Great over stuff. here. And show you these now I've never done a video on these mushrooms before uh, they're a fantastic edible but if you remember this from earlier on you can see they are incredibly similar to our clytocybe here and this is a potentially deadly poisonous mushroom now if you remember when I showed you this one I got you to smell the mushroom and we both sort of thought it had a, a very nice, sweet, mushroomy smell. So just uh, get that one, have a smell. Nice, yeah, sweet, mushroomy smell. Right, okay. These ones, very similar in all ways. You can see the gills, just like on our clytocybe, are decurrent, meaning they run down the stem. The stem is off-centre on the cap which is exactly the same as, as this one here. The stem is wavy, it's not straight and perfect. It's not stout either, just like this mushroom here. And these slightly more mature ones, if these were younger specimens of this mushroom, those gills would be white, but you can see they've gone almost exactly the same color yep. as this one here. Now have a smell of that one. Different smell. Very different. What do you get? Very different. People say... Almost like a, 
watery, maybe not, no, not quite celery, but I don't know, it's doughy, maybe? Doughy, yeasty. Yeah, like, yeah. like, like wet dough, like wet flour. That sort of thing, yeah. Okay. Yeah. A little I get to roll out a really fantastic word here. There's also another description for the smell. It's spermatozoic. Uh, make of that what you will, viewers. But um, for me, that smell is very distinctive and uh, clearly differentiates this mushroom from this mushroom. But I've been foraging for mushrooms for probably 25, 30 years now. So I'm very experienced. And uh, this is a mushroom that when I first started foraging, I didn't really work up the uh, confidence to eat this mushroom for probably about eight or nine years or so. But after I did, um, I found it to be a very, very tasty mushroom. This is the Miller. Clytopilus prunulus. Now I am not recommending this as an edible mushroom for anyone apart from the most experienced foragers. But when you get to that stage, this is a lovely edible mushroom. And because you've got these growing around your garden and there's other mushrooms, we've seen so many today, there could be a different type of white mushroom growing within two or three feet of your lovely cluster of millers there. Now, because you're with me, we're gonna put these millers and the other ones in the basket, but I don't recommend these until you're totally confident, Pete. But I, won't, I won't come out and pick some more tomorrow, that's for sure. Certainly don't feed them to uh, Becky and Bronwyn, please. <laughs> no. uh, unless I'm here or Attila's here helping you. But these mushrooms are a fantastic mushroom to find for a whole different reason. The reason being they form a complex relationship or potentially a parasitic relationship with the Boletus edulis, which is uh, the penny bun or the porcini or uh, the sep or the king Belit if you're watching this in America or the stein pills there if you're watching it in Germany. One of the most sought after mushrooms, edible mushrooms on the planet. The one that I have yet to find myself. Right, really? <clears throat> Well, I think you might be in luck today <laughs> because um, I, I, I'm not totally convinced personally through experience that the Miller is only building that relationship with the Edulus because I've found it in places where um, you, I've only found uh, other members of the large Boletus group. So the Scarlatina Belit and the Iodine Belit and the Boletus Luridis. Um, those are three that I've found the Miller with as well without any Porcinis or Penny Buns being there. It might just have been that I was there at the wrong time and the, the penny buns were gonna fruit there at a different time. And uh, you will find penny buns without finding millers. But I have never found a miller where there aren't large beliefs growing. Now, let's have a little wander around to the back of, uh, of your lovely chestnut tree here. Because um, you spend a lot of time in your garden, don't you? <laughs> Nowhere near as much as I should. Well, um, considering you spend quite a lot of time in your garden, there's some more of our millers. Lots and lots of our millers. All of these, let me just check the smell. That's our poisonous one. I will throw this miles away from the millers just in <laughs> case of accident later on. But considering you spend so much time in your garden, Pete, how have you not seen this monster <laughs> before? <laughs> I have no idea. That's almost a bit embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> One of the most sought after mushrooms, a huge specimen, and, and I've not noticed that. Now, there, there's possibly more growing. When they're very young, they'll be pale and almost white on the cap, and then they'll grow up into this lovely brown dome capped mushroom, looking much like a penny bun, hence our British name, the, yeah. uh, the penny bun. And uh, this is another one. Let's get it out. Look at that, <laughs> of those spongy bottom mushrooms. This wow. one's quite mature because as you can see, our sluggy friend there is trying to get hold of it. But um, as you can see, the pores aren't pure white. If this was in absolute pristine condition, the pores would be pure white. As they start to age, the pores will go a little bit yellow, as you see here. Um, now, if you've got a mushroom that looks like this, then it's 
almost definitely one of the penny bung clade but there's one last thing uh, for you to spot which will confirm your identification and that's the presence of let's see where it's most easy to see i'm not sure the camera is going to pick it up in this light but up there you'll have to be very still attila my shaky hands aren't going to help but we have what looks like a bit of white netting at the top of the stem there can you see yeah, that yeah i can just see that yeah that's called reticulation and if the reticulation is white then you've got one of the penny bung clade the dark set has slightly darker reticulation um but uh the pinophilus the, the reticulatus and this one the edulus so that's the pine belete or the pine set the summer set and the true set the penny bun they all have white reticulation at the uh, top of the stem so we found some good edible mushrooms really in is. your garden <laughs> today this is a showstopper I'm very, very jealous. I do hope you're going to invite me around more often. Um, Absolutely. I, I think it's essential given what you've shown us today. <laughs> and it just goes to show, if you get somebody around who's, who's got that experience and that knowledge, there's an abundance of things here. I mean, it, we've only just looked at mushrooms for one day. If we came another day, there'd be more. Mm. And we haven't touched on the plants that, that are here that we might be able to eat Absolutely. As well, you so. showed me a, a picture of a, a mushroom that was growing in your garden in spring. Turned out it was a morel. So not only <laughs> does this man have lovely giant horse mushrooms, millers, and uh, uh, what else have we got in the basket there? Some, some bluets and uh, some other agaricus and some lovely uh, birch beliefs. He has penny buns and morels in his garden. Colour me jealous. What about you, Attila? Is this one of the uh, nicest little two-acre plots that you've ever gone for a wander in? Well, I'm a bit disappointed by the number of polypores, but that's fine. At the ability <laughs> point of view, it is one of the best pots I've ever been. You can't keep everyone happy. That's why of I don't want to be a politician. Um, <laughs> anyway, there you go. The showstopper of the day, a Belitus edulis. Now, I do hope you make good use of this. and have a certainly nice, will. A nice mushroomy dinner later on. Anyway, thank you very much for having us round. Are you going to take me back to the stag's head for a beer? I think it'd be rude not to. Good stuff. Let's <laughs> head there now. <laughs>